I'd like to ask both of our gentlemen first to share uh, an individual recollection uh, uh, germane to this afternoon. I'm going to ask you, Donald, to say a couple of words about your dear friend and colleague, Neil. And Phil, I'd like for you to share uh, something you shared with me, a, a very uh, lovely anecdote about what the ASO can do for a tired and frazzled soul at the end of a very, very busy and trying day. Donald, would you begin? First of all, a very good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege to be part of this inaugural Neil Asks uh, Sue, thank you. Uh, if Neil were to walk in that door right now, I don't think anybody would bat an eyelid. Uh, be a little spooky, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> it is just for me uh, unfathomable that he's no longer with us. Uh, a very important part of my Thursday, and I was delighted to be able to uh, write a short tribute to Neil. A very important part of the Thursday uh, concert, which is so to speak, the premiere of a new program, such as last night, uh, was indeed when uh, Neil came down, Neil and Sue came down, and uh, we talked through the program. Uh, Neil was uh, larger than life in every respect, and his insight into music, but his willingness, above all, in repertoire, uh, that he perhaps had even sung himself, or repertoire that uh, he had certainly heard many times. Uh, he n was never not curious to hear it done differently. He was always looking for new insights. And obviously, uh, this was very much Neil Williams in, in everything he did. And uh, we would sit, uh, indeed, down in the conductor's suite and uh, uh, just enjoy the most enlivening and inspiring conversations, but not just about, not just about the music that we just heard, and once again, if I may repeat myself, uh, or in terms of what I've written about, uh, Neil represents, didn't represent, no, this is not the past, this is the, uh, the present and very much the future. Uh, he represents for me uh, everything that is really so special about this remarkable organization, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Chorus. Um, this is a phenomenal, orchestra, it is a phenomenal chorus, it is a phen phenomenal team. And uh, this word is used perhaps and sometimes abused, but um, it is a family. It really does, when I return here uh, for three weeks a year as principal guest conductor, and I have been here 12 years, uh, each time it's returning to some of my closest friends. Uh, and is there any greater gift than sharing music together, uh, I, and I include amongst these friends, of course, the orchestra, the chorus, and Neil, uh, because his, I'm very aware of how storied this organization is. And in terms of internationally, how comparatively, as old as the city is, comparatively young its culture is. And, oh my goodness, I wish there were more Neil Williams. Uh, over in Europe, uh, where, and I'm, no doubt we may get around to talking about this, but um, that uh, with the Neil, with the orchestra, with you ladies and gentlemen, with the audience, each time it feels, no matter what the repertoire is, it's fresh. One has to assume that many people may be hearing last night, for instance that repertoire for the very, very first time. One can, though, also assume that when one performs Beethoven's Fifth Symphony at Piedmont this evening, there will be many people who will be hearing that music for the very first time. And that turns my work into that of an ambassador. And that's where, uh, for me, uh, uh, Neil Williams just symbolizes, personifies that uh, his reaction was always as if it ha he'd just heard something for the very first time and was so eager to talk about it and was so eager, um, certainly in the world of arts, to, to tie in the world of business in the sense of a city is its culture. 
And once again, this is something where when we brought the uh, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Chorus to Berlin for the first time uh, in 2003, uh, Neil was of course, Neil and Sue were of course, of course there. And uh, if I may digress a little, um, bringing the chorus to Berlin was undoubtedly a huge highlight of my professional career. But this wasn't just about a, a musical happening. This was deeply um, human, a, a deeply social, almost political uh, occasion. Uh, many of you will remember. Um, we appeared uh, hot on the heels uh, of a war that was uh, being fought uh, against whom, uh, in terms of uh, whether one was for it or against it, uh, there, was, there were many, many in Germany who uh, were not in favor of what happened. And, of course, we plan these events years in advance, and uh, <coughs> one cannot know how the politics will overtake the arts. Uh, and all of a sudden, and the, the, the newspapers were writing about uh, this, uh, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, um, um, my word, but Coca-Cola land, uh, describing it in what I, I can only uh, term condescending about, yes, this, uh, Berlin has many, Berlin has what, seven or eight orchestras, three opera companies, countless museums, many choruses. Why on earth would we be bringing uh, a chorus to the Berlin Philharmonic or the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Chorus? Well, it was because of the, my relationship to the orchestra, my relationship to Simon Rattle, my relationship to, to the chorus. Well, the chorus came, and the rest is history, as they say. Uh, if I may share a, a little anecdote. Um, at the very first rehearsal, um, this was Benjamin Britten, by the way, a, a proper, <laughs> which makes this experience even more profound, a war requiem this great, phenomenal, monumental work um, that was written uh, by this deep, deeply uh, uh, devout pacifist. And uh, the first rehearsal, of chorus was there, and the orchestra began, and we were in the first movement, and it gets to um, at the end of the very first movement of this work, uh, there is this a cappella. In other words, the chorus sang by itself. Uh, it's haunting and beautiful music. And to a man, I'm not even sure that's politically correct anymore, to a person, to a man, um, the entire orchestra were focused on me, waiting to see what the chorus is like. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> they turned to the chorus and the, the, the transformation the look in their eyes, these moist eyes of this seasoned, tough orchestra, the Berlin Philharmonic, the love affair began. And here was, here was uh, uh, two countries coming together, in a sense, culturally and politically. And that is something that, where I went in that, and now I really must stop talking because Phil has far greater <laughs> insights. But this, this is what touches me. This, this ability not only to perform great works with a great orchestra and with a great chorus, but to change people's lives and to bring countries closer together. And I, I, I don't wish that to sound as, um, uh, pompous or arrogant, but in that moment, and, and each visit we've been back, it's, 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 it's been a, a similar thing. And if art can bring countries together like that, then the question of culture and why does a city uh, need it's art. I think the answer lies there. Thank you. Phil, you travel the world constantly. I think our conversations in preparation for this event took place, I was in one city, but you were in three different ones, I think, by the time we got a chance to speak. But you've had a recent experience with the ASO, which has been one of a, a great tonic and a solace at the end of a tough week. And I'm wondering if you could share that with us. Sure. I also just want to say how much I, you know, I love Neil. I miss Neil. I, you know, when your own father's 94 years old and can't remember where he put his car keys, it's pretty good to have uh, somebody who could be a father figure mentor. He was that for me, and and uh, just an amazing guy. And um, so I'm happy to to do this. The, the, what the what you are 
referring to, I, Stanley knows this, a couple of weeks ago, I have a lot of bad days in my line of work. It's 24 hours, television, a lot of it live. Anything and everything can go wrong at any hour of the day in any corner of the world, and it often does. And um, I was having a particularly lousy day at the end of a particularly lousy week and looking forward to a particularly boring dinner over at the Four Seasons across the street. And that afternoon, I get the ASO blast email about the uh, Beethoven Sixth Symphony being played. Call up Dr. Stanley, said, hey, <laughs> I think I could just sneak in for the second act. I, I don't need a good seat, I'll just stand in the back. I really could use a little distraction and I really happen to love this piece. Sure, it comes sit with me, meet in the Shaw room, so we did that. And it was magical. I mean, it's, uh, it could have been another piece too. This one happens to be everybody grew up with it. It was the soundtrack to Fantasia. Uh, kids grew up with it. Um, and by the end of 45 minutes or however long the piece is, I was better. I wasn't perfect, but I was better. It was a wonderful, it was it cost a hell of a lot less than therapy, even if I had paid for the ticket. <laughs> and, uh, and probably cheaper than a bottle of Brunello, like the one that Neil got me drunk on one night. <laughs> and and um, it was, it was a, and it just, and it really, to me, it, it really personalized to me, and I've had many experiences like this. This happened to be the most recent one. It personalized to me the power of art. Uh, I had similar, by the way, I just had a similar experience going to the Frida and Diego show at the High recently. I mean, it was just, it was, I was unprepared for how transforming the work was and how brilliant the work was. I, I'd kind of known the story, but I'd never really seen the work. And when I walked in that room and saw that one gigantic mural, it just took the air out of my lungs. And that's the, I mean, that's the power of art. And, and that's why, you know, not only at a personal level, I realize how important it is, you know, for a city and as a business, quote unquote, business leader in a city to support the arts is because they really are that powerful and they really are that. It's everything that Donald just said so beautifully. It, 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 you know, music, music in its own way is an ambassador. It's, 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 it's a force, music and art and theater. It's such, a, it's such a force for good and it's such a force for community that I think it's absolutely essential to support the arts. Thank you, Phil. I get to ask the first couple of questions and then I am very eager for questions uh, that will have been collected from the floor. Um, there are sound and tested business principles that motivate the for-profit world. And Phil, you're a wonderful representative of the <coughs> world. And quite often when this question is asked, hands fly up in horror that the not-for-profit world and the for-profit world are essentially two different business models and never the twain shall meet. But clearly, the not-for-profit world is badly in need of an overhaul. Um, every arts institution <laughs> struggles and continues to struggle. So from your perspective, are there key things we can learn from the recent and, let's say, not so recent, going back to the financial crisis of just a few years ago, and how business has come out of that or is coming out of that? Are there things, are there lessons that we can learn from how the for-profit world has dealt with the recent economic crisis as we look at our own challenging future? Yeah, there's many lessons. I also want to make the observation, I think this is, uh, this is a little bit of nonsense, is it, that there is that much of a difference, or there should not be that much of a difference. I mean, every organization exists to produce something. And I'll just use the only one I've known in the last 20 years is Turner Broadcasting. It's part of a big public corporation. My job is to produce a certain level of profit every year, but I don't have a printing press to produce money. What produces the profit is is a cultural and intellectual product, whether it's news or cartoons or broad or narrow entertainment programming. And in order to produce that intellectual product, my job is to create an environment where people come to work every day passionate about what they do, whether it's a reporter freezing their butt off on the Khyber Pass somewhere, or a crazy cartoonist thinking up the, the latest late night cartoon. It's, and, and, to, and to have the, the business monetization machinery of salespeople and distribution people and technology to be able to process all that passion into real profits. And it's a very simple, it's, it's moronically simple business. It's you, you, you have a product, you believe in the product, you try to make it as best as possible, and you sell and market the hell out of it. And to me, the, the arts, the carload to the arts should really be no different. While there may not be public shareholders 
of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. There is a bottom line. I've seen it. There is a budget. And, and the truth is, the more money that the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra or the High Museum can make, the more they can invest back into their core product, into the arts to serve, to serve the community. So I think the principles should be, the, should be very, very similar. I actually, I, I get a little impatient with people that think they're all that different. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that one of the things that I found in the years that I worked with Joe Bankoff and others on the, on the board here, I, I would sometimes get a little impatient is that the product is so wonderful here. What Donald does, what Robert does, the other guests that come in, what we do at the museum, at the Alliance, but I have always felt that it has been it is chronically under-marketed and under-promoted within the broader community. And I think one of the great principles of business is have a core product, understand the attributes of that product, and then market it to as broad an audience as possible. And try to get new people in, in to see it. And try to get it, figure out, you know, in, interesting ways to get new people, so the, the core product of the, of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra is symphonic music, classical music. So uh, a couple of months ago, and I just went, not only because he's a friend of our companies and a, and a partner of ours, Steven Spielberg came and did with John Williams this fabulous e evening of the importance of music in film. And, it, and to me, that was a great, so you'd get people that would come to that that normally might not come to the orchestra. That, that and I've seen other examples here, where it's just a great way to get people, A, to just understand this place exists. I mean, I think there's whole segments of the population in Atlanta that are under-marketed to for classical music. I mean, and sometimes I feel that, I don't want to sound too critical, but you know, I'm not on the board anymore, I can offend a few people. Um, I, I sometimes feel, I mean, do we have people here from the Coca-Cola company, if, if, if they only marketed to the people that have historically been drinking Coca-Cola, they would not be the company they are today. And the same thing for Turner Broadcasting, the same thing goes for a symphony orchestra. You have to continue to try to, to broaden your reach. And I think that, we, that the, the competitive set for a, for a classical music performance, for a theatrical performance, for a visit to an art museum, should not just be the other arts options that are available, but it should be you're competing with a Hawks game, a Braves game, watching you know the latest reality show on television. For, the, for younger people, the, the, the bars and bucket that everybody seems to like to go to every night. And I think that, 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 that the product of this institution, properly marketed, can be you know, presented as, hey, what a great alternative for a date night. Want to impress somebody? You know, I won't use the line I use privately with Stanley, but, but <laughs> want to impress somebody? Bring them, you know, bring them to a symphony. Don't bring them to some, the latest singles bar uh, you know, in, in Buckhead. And I, and I think that we just have to keep Drilling at home, it doesn't, in no way demeans or undermines the integrity of the art to market it to the broadest possible audience and to learn from business. And I've tried to put, I've tried to put colleagues of mine on the different boards of the Woodruff Arts Center that can really bring this expertise, that know a lot about marketing, that know a lot about how to, how to do audience segmentation analysis, uh, to figure out where you can find new markets without undermining the product. I want to be very clear, I would never talk about compromising the, the, the product at all. The artistic director should decide what the product is, but then market the hell out of it to the broadest possible audience in the most ingenious ways possible using every media platform. Ever. And that's what, that's what state-of-the-art companies like Coca-Cola, like Turner, like other companies in town here in Atlanta do, and I think the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra should be doing the same. Thank you. Donald, you have a unique perspective in this room in that you work both in, as we fondly say, old Europe and still relatively new America with positions in Europe and a life that at the moment is more centered in Europe than in the United States, but still with the Grand Teton Festival, with guest appearances with American orchestras and with your relationship with us. You bring a unique perspective to what's happening elsewhere in terms of how and if there is a shift because when we think of, let's say, the German orchestra system, we think of, or the German opera system, we think of uh, the land of milk and honey, as it were, where state subsidies are enormous and experimentation is the rule of the day. But is that beginning to change? Is the gravy train slowing down some? And are our European colleagues having to wake up to some of the things that Phil has just talked about? 
from your own perspective? It most certainly is true that the, uh, the economic quote-unquote crisis that we all face um, is just as potent um, in, in Europe, uh, where, as you say, it is quite traditional, uh, and uh, it is part of the fabric of, in this case, German life, uh, for the arts to be subsidized. Uh, without going into the long history of this, obviously it goes back hundreds of years to, to all these uh, competing um, princes and uh, all had their own courts and uh, vied with one another to have Johann Sebastian Bach in Mannheim and not in Leipzig or Mozart in Salzburg and not in Vienna. Anyway, this is obviously where this all started, but uh, so money was made available. Uh, because of that, uh, I would say, uh, Culture is assumed to be part of everyday life. I, I conduct at the Deutsche Oper in Berlin. Uh, I do about 40 or 45 performances uh, in a season. Uh, we have close to 35 different productions in one season. Different titles. Wagner, Verdi, Puccini, Mozart. Sometimes we do 200 performances a season. And we have a house of, I would say, 1,800. Uh, and we have a, a pretty, pretty impressive 80 to 85 percent uh, capacity. Clearly, in Berlin, where there are three opera houses, as I said before, th this, this cannot just be, oh, we're, we're appealing to tourists. We're clearly appealing to people who come regularly, who come to the opera once a week or once every two weeks, want to see a new production of Trovatore, want to see a new production of Tosca. Um, it, it, and when people do come to a city, they will assume and know that yes, there is an opera company. Yes, there's a museum. Most certainly there's a symphony orchestra. I would say, and I absolutely agree with what he's, what he's, what he's saying and implying, is that with the turnover in a city like Atlanta being as dramatic as it is, we have to assume that a very small portion of people coming to this city even know what a symphony orchestra is, and that this orchestra, this, uh, this city, forgive me, has one of the finest orchestras in the world, one of the finest choruses in the world. And where once upon a time, bef before television, not perhaps before radio, but before television, um, before, the, the, before there was so little in comparison that you could use your time for in terms of free time. What does one do? Where does one go? Um, we are, as a symphony orchestra or a museum or uh, an art gallery, we are competing. We're, we're on some level where one would assume, yes, on a Friday night or Saturday night, you go to the opera, you go to the symphony, or you go to an exhibition or whatever. There are so many, many, many other things that one can do with one's uh, free time. And I absolutely agree. We, we, we have to, Dr. Stanley, get to work. We have to really market a great deal more, but above all, reach out and, and I mean, I've seen some astonishing statistics in the last few days about uh, how many people we are reaching and, and uh, how many core supporters there are in the size of the city. Um, and that's something, obviously, the orchestra has to work hard on. But more importantly, I would, I would uh, address this a little more philosophically. Business needs the arts. The arts needs business. Why do I say that? Ultimately, we're all looking for the meaning of why we're here. Spiritually, socially, just as a human being, what is all about? What is this all about? And, and I think it's remarkable and wonderful that through the sad death of Neil, we are then asking, where is he? And why are we all here? And we all need stories. 
you go to the opera, it's a story, it's an allegory. There's, and we all need stories, we need a narrative. We need to know what our part is in that narrative. And that is why the arts is ultimately, I think, there. We're all seeking meaning. And if, if, if one is, for instance, one is going to, to the symphony, um, the greatest music, I think, will touch us. And we may wonder, why are we being touched? What is being touched? But we may just, there, there's a deeper meaning to all of this that, that, for instance, last night's performance or last night's music can touch us. I am absolutely sure that the millions of people here in this metropolitan area who have never either been to a concert or even know that there is a concert here, they are also leading a life where they themselves are seeking meaning. And if we can reach these people and reach this larger audience, and I'm not just talking about, uh, one talks a great deal about the younger generation, but I would say there are people in, the, in their, in their mid-40s, their mid-50s, um, who may still not be aware that there is a symphony orchestra and that it can touch you and you may come to it and you may hear something that changes your life forever. There may be there a message, a meaning. As I say, we all need these stories. I agree absolutely, there's really no difference. And when I say the business needs the arts, um, I, I would be um, uh, uh, forward enough to suggest that and this room is full of extremely successful businessmen and women. I would like to think that just because business is there to, yes, create a profit, each and every one of you also wants to know what is this all about? Where is this all leading? Why do we come to the symphony? Why do we go to an art gallery? Why do we go to a play? Just for, if you like, for um, sustenance. And that's where I would say the business needs the arts and where the arts needs the business is exactly uh, what Phil is addressing. We have to though find, and I think this is something that Neil, certainly in the, in the, the later conversations we had, uh, where Neil was passionate about this, uh, about how can we create a symphony orchestra, or how not create, how can we uh, um, customize a symphony orchestra in a way that is not about making profit, obviously. The profit we make is teach, is, is, I was about to say teaching, or touching, Freudian slip, but um, is touching all of you. That is our profit. Our profit cannot be measured in any way monetarily. It's touching you, touching your children. I, I, I'm often quite humbled at the thought that I will meet, I perhaps met 15 people last night. Well, if you have a very large audience, you have to assume that I will never talk to these people afterwards. I would like to think that they have gone out and are different and have been touched. If we can, uh, in other words, if we can create a viable model whereby we are reaching out more people, uh, to more people, um, I, I think this is something that, and, and this really rather comes back uh, to your question, I think that's something in, in, in Europe, certainly in Germany, um, it, it's, it's hard to compare because that is indeed uh, um, government sponsored because they think it matters. They think a city should be able to afford the arts. They still vie with one another. Munich, with Stuttgart, with, with, with Berlin. Having said that, economically, everybody, it, 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 it's tighter. And what is happening in Europe now is, and this has a lot to do, and I won't get, even get into this because I'm way out of my depth, but it has a great deal with tax, to do with tax laws. And uh, the, the changes are happening whereby private sponsors, private individuals, uh, organizations, large car companies can actually sponsor an opera house or sponsor uh, a symphony because it, it makes business sense. I mean, obviously, this is not just out of the goodness of their hearts. They want to see something too. They wish to be, whether it's uh, Volkswagen or Mercedes-Benz or the Deutsche Bank, uh, of course, they're, they're, um, they are, quote unquote, profiting from being associated with, with um, iconic organizations. 
And that is indeed beginning to change. But uh, I would very much like to think uh, in the years where I keep coming back, if, if you'll have me, uh, back, to, back to Atlanta, uh, that we are literally and figuratively touching far more people. Thank you. Now it's time for your questions, of which I have a lovely variety. We probably won't have time for all of them, and I will ask our two guests to comment each of them a little bit. This is from David Roper, and he asks, why should a corporation care about and commit capital to the arts, culture, a city? I think you both have already partly answered to that, but speaking to um, as if you were addressing a, a corporate officer who's in charge of distributing charitable funds, what's in it for them? Well, I'll give you the non-altruistic, because it's very easy to sit and wax poetically about the altruistic reasons. I'll give you the crass, selfish, self-centered, for-profit reason to do it, particularly for a company like ours. We are trying to attract the best people to work for our company, whether it be in Atlanta or Los Angeles or New York or anywhere in the world. When you're in competition for the best technologists, the best artists, the best journalists, the best writers, they, they want to know that they're coming not only to a company that cares about their community, but they want to know that they're coming to a community that's more than just a place to buy a house and send your kids to school. And it goes back to the, the question of why art, and I'm not gonna, I think Donald was very eloquent on this, why art is so important in this city. We selfishly do things like support the arts, support film festivals, support green space in Atlanta, all for the same common, self-centered, selfish reasons as it, our employees like it. And it makes them feel better about their employer. And it helps us to get people to come to Turner and to stay at Turner. And that's, and that's the truth. We're not doing it to get so that Phil Kent can get a compliment at a cocktail party. You're such a great patron of the arts. It's a nice little thing. Sometimes I get bored with it. But what the real reason we do it, to be really brutally honest, is it's in our selfish interest to be supporting the arts in this and other cities. It's like it's in our selfish interest to have done a big project at Piedmont Park to fix up the ball fields. It makes our own employees feel great about their employer, and it also helps us to, to continue to attract other people to come work at our company. And B, it's the right thing to do as a, as a, as a business leader. It's the right thing to do. But I, I would, and this is not a popular thing to say, but I would, put our, I would say the best reason to do something and the most sustaining reason to do something is a self-interested reason to do something. And I think there is a self-interested reason for corporations, large and small, to support the arts. Thank you. Howard Polevsky asks, what role should public financing play in the arts, and how can businesses help lobby government for the arts to be supported? I think that's probably as much how, as anyone else. <laughs> well, I'm a little cynical on, on government, at least in the United States. Uh, I mean, look, it's become cities have such, we have a city council person sitting here, happens to be a friend of mine, but we, cities are very strapped. I mean, they're making tough decisions. I'm, I'm amazed that they find any money at all left to, to support the arts, and, and they do. Um, I won't even comment on the state of Georgia. Um, please don't tweet that. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and look at the federal government. I mean, I mean, the fact that the National Endowment of the Arts becomes a political issue at all, you know, when it probably costs the amount of one bomb, it's, 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 it's a travesty. So I'm, I'm a little, it'd be wonderful if there could be more. I, you could certainly make the case for it, but in, the, but in the highly partisan political environment that the United States has become today, and we cover this in one of our businesses, um, I'm dubious on whether you can have the kind of public support of the arts that you do in all the countries of Europe, and I used to live there myself, and I, and I, and I would see it. I just think, I think it's gonna have to come from private sources, and I think it's gonna have to come from business, and for more, more, and for more broadly marketing um, 
the, the products of the institutions. I think it'd be great, you know, if uh, if government can help, you know, with a, you know, whether it's tax abatements or things like that to help to build a new symphony or 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 that type of thing. It has, but uh, but but I'm I'm just I'm just realistic. I just think it's going to be more and more difficult in the political environments that we're in right now and the economic environment that we're in to get a lot of public funding. Could I add to that? Please, the, please. The, all of us throughout our entire lives, but particularly when one is young, you look for role models, you look for a hero, you look for somebody who's eloquent, who inspires you, and will on some level direct you, and you will go on a particular, you'll be interested in something because some important charismatic figure um, has told you this, this is an important thing to do. And I would say that in, in this country, uh, imagine the impact of, of the President of the United States finding an opportunity to say, there are many days when I don't really know what to do. I, I sometimes listen to a movement of a Mozart piano concerto. And all of a sudden, something is clearer. John Keating, a, a big political figure in Australia, uh, big supporter of the Sydney Symphony. And I was sitting next to John uh, a few years ago. And uh, John was somebody who spoke, he told me, uh, a day for him has to start with a movement of Mozart or Haydn or even sometimes Mahler. And then he can leave the house and he feels, I know why I'm doing all of this. Today, one looks to basketball players, football players, one looks, and in no way do I wish to decry this incredible love affair that this country has with the sports. But I, this is where I wish, whether it's community leaders or political leaders, what a difference it would make if, if our young youngsters were not just modeling their, how they fill their pri private, their free time on people they look up to. And more specifically, and I should say, uh, more factually, on any given night, you can assume that Angela Merkel is either at the opera or the symphony or opening an art gallery. And she comes privately. She loves it. She came to a, um, I, I've uh, gotten to know this remarkable woman quite well. And she doesn't do it, it's not a photo op. She comes because, um, We've talked, we, we sat down a, a month ago. Uh, David Cameron came to, to Berlin, I'm sure you will have read about it. And uh, there's a, quite a, f a feud, um, but a, um, it's, it's a political hot water at the moment uh, between, certainly when it comes to the membership of the European Union, etc., etc. And anyway, David Cameron came, was invited privately by Angela Merkel, and Angela Merkel wanted to then to put on, uh, have a dinner where, where um, uh, quote unquote prominent uh, people in Berlin who have this strong British German connection, of course I do, um, would sit down and uh, we, would, we would exchange our, um, uh, our views on why it is the British German connection culturally, politically so important. It was a fascinating evening. And I'm sitting next to Angela Merkel and we get into conversation. And I know for a fact that when she speaks, and, and um, whether she is opening an art gallery or whether she is uh, coming to the opening of Parsifal, she's there because it means the world, she needs it. It's fodder for her soul. And so you, and one asks, what, uh, what is so different between Europe and, and this country? For me, I remember when uh, President Obama was uh, at the inauguration ceremony, when Yo-Yo Ma, you may recall, it was a freezing day, uh, played at the inauguration. I would say that the collective classical music world went, yes! Thank you. We are coming to close to the end of our time, and I think that this would be a, a wonderful question with which to close, because I think there's something that both of our guests can respond to. This is from Lynn Eden. The, she directed initially to you, Donald. You mentioned how Berliners are dedicated to the arts. Uh, compare how the arts are promoted in schools in Germany versus the US in general, Atlanta in particular, if it's within your ken, and how important it is to reach these young people, the audience of tomorrow. 
well, I happen to know this um, personally as much as uh, um, professionally because um, our children uh, go to school in, in Berlin before we were in uh, San Francisco and moved to Berlin officially uh, two years ago and uh, 15, 11 and 8, the children. And uh, they go to a, it's a wonderful name, we didn't choose the name because of the actual, uh, uh, this person, Nelson Mandela Schule. Um, but it certainly had something, wow. uh, the name. Anyway, uh, this is a, a proper German school. Uh, German is predominantly spoken. Uh, the young ones are now fluent. Um, there, I know, because this happens, um, uh, music is a very important part of it, and they have regular lessons. Um, the two young, young, youngsters are now uh, both playing cello. Um, and that's not just because they come from a musical family. Um, they are, it, it just, it, it's an integral part of their education. Um, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's uh, what, what, we, what we find, though, um, is that there are, there are just so many more things that children can do with the time, once again. Um, but the arts, whether it's, whether it's reading, writing, um, uh, culture, the appreciation thereof, it, it's, it's integral. It, it really is integral. Mm -hmm. integral. And I, I, I know that, um, and that this is something that I the many years I was working uh, as music director at San Francisco Opera, uh, where we had these programs for youth and, and attracting youngsters in, we found ourselves having to get further and further back into the process. I should say, uh, we had to be, because music was playing so little of a role in ever younger students, that it was no longer about uh, how do we attract uh, a 15 or a 16 year old. It's how can we help in giving a, an eight year old an education in music? And oh, you can't do that single handedly. Um, so th that's something I, I would say that is certainly far less of a problem uh, in, in Europe. This must, must sound, ladies and gentlemen, as if, if I'm saying it is the land of milk and honey uh, in Europe. Uh, that's something I, I fight a great deal is uh, the spirit of entitlement, um, that orchestras have a right to exist, opera companies have a right to exist, a museum has a right to exist. Um, and that, that obviously comes from centuries of, yes, they have existed, um, but it can become quite jaded, this feeling of, of course I play in the Deutsche Oper Berlin, of course I'm in this orchestra or I'm in this ballet company because it's subsidized or because, yes, I have a right to. And uh, what I find so beautiful uh, in America so often is, uh, is not this feeling of entitlement, that it's more, I would say, it's a privilege to be doing what we're doing. And it's not a given. And we are utterly reliant on business. We are utterly reliant on generous private individuals giving money and supporting what is a very, very expensive art form. In this case, a symphony orchestra, of course. It is expensive um, to put a symphony orchestra together. These are the finest musicians in the country, among the finest musicians in the country. They've given their life to do what they're doing. And you, we see the iceberg, or the tip of the iceberg. That is to say the concert. But what you haven't seen are the decades of practice that go into this. And the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra should be in a position as one of the finest in this country, if not the world, of attracting the finest artists. And that comes at a price. Um, it is only as good as the musicians that it attracts. And therefore, it's obviously, um, we are very, very much uh, looking to business and looking to, to, to private individuals or corporations to support us. Um, but still, I have to say, uh, every time I come back here, as I said, uh, to the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, I'm struck by this wide-eyed curiosity, this, what are we going to do this week? And how can we approach it? And this genuine feeling of, it's not an entitlement that we are sitting up on stage. It's a privilege. And it's a, quite a, a humble realization. Phil, looking towards tomorrow and keeping the youth of our city, let's just focus on hometown. 
What are some of the things that you feel are important for attracting a new generation? Well, I, I think it's a very sad state of affairs, but when I was growing up and went to public school in New York, um, one of the first fully integrated public schools in New York, there was compulsory art, music, uh, at every grade level. Today, this is a relic of the past because of budget cuts and because of the problems of the public school system. And we also had, you know, I was of the generation that grew up with the Leonard Bernstein Young People's Concerts on public television. That's a relic of the past. So you have this vacuum now. What do you do? The only way, and this is not, again, it's not altruistic. The only way for, not altruistic for an arts institution, the only way to invest in your future audience, because to be brutally honest, I was at the performance last night. I got up, I looked around the room. It's demographically not young and demographically, no offense to anyone who was there, I'm a white middle-aged male too, demographically not young, demographically not very uh, diverse. And I think one of the great ways to get at this is primary school, maybe junior high school. By time high school, you may have missed it, maybe not. I think there's always time to fall in love with the arts and classical music, but we have to get, and I think, I think the orchestra does a very good job of this. I see it, I see the buses here, also for the museum. We have to really work at this and make the investment of this because it's incumbent, it's incumbent on the arts institutions and the businesses that, and the individuals that to support them to make sure there's dedicated funds going to getting into the schools and getting the kids into the, into the halls, even if it's just to watch a rehearsal. I think, I think it's really important because the public education, it's not there, it's not coming back anytime soon. Maybe it is for the 30 private schools in Atlanta that some people have the privilege of sending their kids to, but it's not there in the public schools. It's not a priority of the school boards. And, um, and it's great that it still happens in a lot of cities in Europe, but we have to accommodate for the fact that it's kind of a relic of the past here. And we have to, and we have to make up for that. And it's an investment in a future audience. It's, a way, it's I mean, look, CNN, we do student news. We don't do this for our health. And we do, we do a half hour student news at 4.30 in the morning, the teachers tape and they show it in class during the day. <clears throat> and it's a nice thing to do and we get all kinds of public service awards for doing it, but also it helps to get kids interested in watching news on television. So it's an investment in the future. And campus-wide, of course, you probably all know about Teen Arts Vibe, which is something of which all of us, members of the Woodruff Arts Center, are very proud. Um, our talent development program at the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, I believe, will celebrate 20 years next season in reaching out to uh, underserved populations to bring them to that level of musical expertise where they can go to a conservatory. Our Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra continues its work, but we can always do more. Gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough. I also want to give my apologies to those whose questions did not get to be answered. We only have so much time we could be here all afternoon. But I want to, on behalf of our President and CEO and all of my colleagues in the orchestra, and thanks to Sue and to all of you who made this possible today, thank you so much for helping us remember Neil and carrying on his legacy in the best way possible by continuing the dialogue that is so vital to our future. Thank you.